Mike, you have a sudden urge to want to just enter into depths of worship. So you call up the praise team members and ask them to meet you at the facility. And you call up the banner wavers and the dancers and you run to the facility. You get the lights turned on, the sound system turned on, the musicians in place. Tell them the song that's on your heart. And when they start playing and the dancers start dancing, then you can worship. Is that the way it goes? Well, Barry, <laughs> you missed a very important part here. In all of your 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 desire, total complete desire to set the mood, you turn the lights on too bright. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot to turn the air conditioning to the perfect temperature. Yeah, the well, sound I, system is a little bit too loud, Barry. It can't be loud. Mm. There's no such thing as too loud. Ah, uh, and, <laughs> and 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 you have people that you know. I mean, they just got off work, and uh, there, there's all kinds of things wrong with this scenario, Barry. Well, you know, Mike, we're just out of practice. It's actually been a month uh, since we were able to produce a Foundations for Life. I mean, you've been just doing this jet setting all over the world, and. Uh, and you've been I've in been, Grassy Creek. I've been in Grassy Creek, and I've been <laughs> to the mountains for uh, anniversary celebration, and uh, stuff's just been flying around. But it's good to see you. I've talked to you, but I actually can see your face, and yeah, I preferred the phone call. But it, it's good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought I looked better on radio. Yeah. <laughs> well, Barry, we want to talk about for last for next few weeks uh, or however long I don't know what it's going to be. Uh, this this thing that you just mentioned of worship, and of course, you know the the moment that uh, that I start talking about worship, I got to go to Mount Moriah. I need to go to the verses of uh, of Genesis Bereshit, which talk about the binding of Isaac, and that Abraham looked at the boy that his. That's where I'm uh, there. Right there where you're at, huh? I'm okay, right well, yeah. I wasn't spiritual enough to open my Bible yet. But, <laughs> uh, I did, but it wasn't there. Uh, and so, you know, we, we look at this, and, and this, these verses where Abraham looks at the at his servants and says, you guys stay here. Me and the lad, we're going to go to the mountain. We're going to worship and return. And this verse gives me great hope, Barry, because as a person who has no talent— who can only play a radio, can only draw flies. I can't even whistle. So I can't, I, I, I can't, I can't, I don't sing well. I don't play an instrument. Um, I don't see any, I don't see any music. Do you? So th this is telling me that worship doesn't have to have music, but music can be worship. But music can be just music without worship. Does that make sense? Oh, uh, people listen to music without worshiping all the time. Even, yeah. even you know, uh, religious music or or Christian music or Hebraic music, whatever you want to call it. We have, at least I think in our culture, become very music dependent. And there's nothing wrong with worshiping with music. Music is a great worship enhancer. Um, I can hear a song, and it can instantly change an attitude, set a mood, create a, a, a yearning for a response, give me focus, give me a, an understanding of who I am addressing. Uh, I remember years ago, my... Uh, it became very popular and trendy to pray by music. Mm -hmm. And uh, the old timers would go to church early on Sunday night in particular and gather in one of the Sunday school rooms downstairs that were all cinder block lined walls with a hard floor and metal folding chairs. And so when you had four or five guys plus in this small echo chamber, yeah, full of reverb, and they began to all lift up their voice and cry aloud at the same time. This is not a hold your hands and one pray at a time type thing. Yeah. It was a roar in there. And in would walk this particular guy with his boom box and Jimmy Swagger tape. 
<laughs> and turn on music and want to kneel down and pray to music. Yeah. Totally different paradigm. And my dad coming home one night spoke to me. He said, I just don't understand why he thinks he has to bring that boom box and have music to pray. Well, for him, that was his mode. Now, maybe he should have gone and found a different room. Maybe. <clears throat> I've done it both ways. You know, I've had some musical background in parade. I've, I, I, I don't normally do that. Uh, but we have become very music dependent that if we don't have this support system, we don't know how to worship. Here's, here's what I think is the root of worship, and then it can branch out in all different kinds of methodologies and practices. The idea of worship is, Abraham said, we're going to go there, and the idea is we're going to bow down. Yeah, yeah. It is the, whether you physically prostrate yourself or whether you spiritually prostrate yourself, it is to bend your heart, your will, and humble your mind and your intentions to one who is greater. That means that my, we can worship a lot of different things, ideas, causes, or people, when we humble ourselves before them, bend over, and uh, submit our will to theirs as if they are a greater power. Okay. So backing up just a little bit to then come back to where you are there, uh, to have music, and I, I'm not picking on music here, but it's going to be something I'm going to pick on. Uh <laughs> I'm not going to have music, but it's something I'm going to pick on. Yeah. Uh, okay. To to have to have music in the background, could we also say that a person is having to have noise in the background? White because, noise of some sort, maybe. Huh? White noise of some sort. Yeah, some kind of noise in the background. And I was talking to the guys uh, the other night on um, – on life on purpose, uh, unashamed plug. It just got put up on the internet today. Uh, and just in fact, just about 10 minutes ago, uh, that we've lost the, the ability to be silent. You know, David said, be still and know that I am Elohim. Uh, the word sila has so much to do with silence. There's, there's many places in scripture that talk about silence. Uh, the, the the patriarchs did not have the noise that we do. You've talked about going out into the desert. Um, you get out in, in a place of that there's nothing, nothing except your own thoughts, and and silence. As I said on on the program, uh, silence may be may be golden, but it's also deafening <laughs> yeah. in in your own head. And so is there a point of worship? Does, does worship begin with noise, with audible whatever, or does silence begin with, or does worship begin with silence? Does true worship begin with silence of emptying yourself of yourself? Emptying yourself of the things around you, emptying yourself of of your own agendas and and all those things that go on in our mind, and in that silence we then begin to focus, and that focus is then called worship, which can come forth in many forms. If you think about some of the more ancient writings, commentators and the depth of which they write. I mean, we're still going back and reading Rashi's commentary that goes back to 11, 1200s type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, other, you know, Spurgeon had, had written volumes that are just uh, overwhelming at time at his oh, insight. Yeah. 
Um, but Mike, they lived in a time where you didn't have a constant barrage of electronic sourced media and noise. There was no TV playing in the background. I don't know the number of times that I've heard someone say, uh, you know, I just have the TV on in the background for noise. They, they, it's uncomfortable to yeah. be quiet. Um, one of the things about going to my grandparents' house uh, in Indian Valley uh, was it's quiet. You know, until I was probably an early teenager, they didn't have a TV. If anything, <laughs> they listened to the radio a little bit, maybe. But most of the nights were spent sitting in the living room with family and talking. Yeah. But even then, it wasn't a loud vocal. It was just soft conversational tones because there's no noise to compete with. One of the most beautiful sounds I can remember is sitting on the front porch there in that little country home. And Grandpa had these very large white pines that made a, a line across the front of his yard. And when the mountain breezes began to blow through those white pines, it was just a, a particular sound mm. that was very peaceful, very settling. And it was the sound of the natural wind that could get you into a place of hearing. Again, going back to the verse that you quote, be still and know. If, if Yah is speaking out of a background of sound, then his voice competes a little bit and it softens the volume, perhaps, of what he is saying. When you're still and quiet and at ease and he speaks, mm -hmm. it can be, it pierces, it's overwhelming to some degree. So we have become uncomfortable with that. We have become addicted to no the sounds that are around us. And it's not to say that I don't want to be negative here in this aspect. It's not to say that in spite of all that, that we don't worship appropriately. I've had some incredible times and noticed other people, you know, thoroughly engaged in acts of worship meaningful, life-changing, impacting worship, and it's good. But again, I think at some point we may have become addicted and um, dependent on, overly dependent upon mm -hmm. stimulation, where uh, it's something word. other than the magnificence of him, it's the emotional impact of what's going on around us. So I, I guess we could say that a lot of what is termed uh, mo uh, worship is basically soulish emotion. Would that be fair? And I've heard that. <laughs> I've heard, uh, yes, I agree, but it, I've heard that soulish emotion is not worship. It is a element of worship. Your soul does need to be involved. Your emotions do yeah. need to be involved. But if you only have an emotional release, you become weepy, tears fall down your face, you become emotionally involved, or you become ecstatic and it's jump, jump, shout, shout, hurrah. Those are good things, but if that's all that you have is an emotional release, then I'm not going to tell you that you didn't worship. I would suggest there's more to it that can be involved than that. I, I would say that emotional, uh, soulish emotion drives you back to, such as uh, the, the same as a, uh, a, a drug addict does that it becomes your fix. However, you never come to the place of being fixed. Okay? Yes. Yeah. It, you, you get a fix, 
if I, from from people that I've known that have had problems with drugs, uh, your drug is your fix, but you never get fixed. And so that soulish emotion, it, it, it has its place, but yet it should drive you to a further something deeper. And I, l- l- let me go kind of a, a little different run at this. And I said I would pick on music. Um, I was thinking about this early this morning, Barry. Go back to the, the Jesus movement uh, back in the 60s. You know, what brought forth uh, what? I remember those days. Yeah. Uh, what brought forth um, uh, Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith, the the Jesus people on the beaches, that kind of thing. Uh, this evolved into the, the coffee shops. What was this? It was somebody sitting down with an acoustic guitar. Maybe they had a microphone. Maybe they didn't. But they just, it, it became this intimate setting that was kind of uh, detached from the world around them. I believe, and this is a, this is definitely going to be a statement of judgment. I believe that the worst thing that ever happened to Christian music was the Dove Awards. I think you I know take, where you're going. Huh? I think I know where you're going. With that. Okay. When you take the the Grammys and the Oscars and the you know this thing and that thing and all these awards, and it becomes about the person. Now I remember uh-huh. weeping to to the first few times I heard Sandy Patty, and and Amy uh-huh. Grant, and and some of these early uh, for me early people. Uh, some of these songs were, they were amazing, but then it went from there to concerts and then it went to the, the stage productions and then it went to the awards and somewhere along the way, the purpose got lost. It became about us, about our emotions, about Oh, didn't you hear this this last person that's you know this 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 last wonder that's on the scene? And it becomes about people instead of about Yah. The first time that I, I saw something about, you know, this 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 group won a, a dove award, I thought, you know, that's just the world's system that has now been embraced by people who I believe had a heart for God, but allowed the system to, to, to come into that. And when we do that, we lose in the end. I see your point. I also understand the, the drive that some have to have a successful musical career. Um, uh, I remember, uh, recording a CD that you encouraged us to to put together at the time and had 600 copies made. I've got about five boxes of those if you want one. (laughs) (laughs) I think we made a a whopping hundred bucks off of that. (laughs) Yeah, to come to your defense on that, uh, the, the person that you had do your mix didn't do you any favors you know that well uh there was there were some recording issues and there were some mix issues yeah. and so forth but in uh you know anyway the uh the desire is to do things do it well and be recognized at least to some i mean anybody appreciates someone saying that was well done mm-hmm. what regardless of what you're doing To say then that someone has a you know is is uh, has successfully uh, entered into music. You're right. If we have to have a stage produced, glamorized award system, we've missed the point. 
how many times has someone, let's say Exodus Roadman, gone into a venue, played well, sang well, touched hearts, lives were impacted, and outside of that venue, nobody really knew what was going on. Oh, yeah. But they had a successful musical opportunity. Now, it may take kingdom days for them to be honored and rewarded for that, but they did it nonetheless. There have been times that I play guitar for myself here in this office and entered into a place of worship and had an encounter with the Most High. There was no one else in the world aware of what was going on, but I had a successful musical encounter. Mm -hmm. Outside of music, as we've been talking, you know, we can and have become very music dependent. To bring ourselves to a place of bowing down, humbling, submitting, acknowledging that he is so much greater, so far greater than ourselves, that we have become very small in our sight and he has become extremely, magnificently, overwhelmingly large, involves the concept of contemplation. Mm -hmm. And that means being still, being quiet, and just thinking on him. So we have heard uh, a lot of teaching over generations about uh, meditation is a problem, you know, and it's always been incorporated in the idea of transcendental meditation as if we are engaged in some kind of a, uh, idol God somewhere. That's not mm -hmm. true. The words of the, of the Psalms are replete with the idea of thinking about considering when I consider you, when I think about you, when I, you know, I'm overwhelmed at you. Obviously, David and other writers of the Psalms took some time and were thinking about the Most High in such ways that they were inspired to put words down on a page. Mm -hmm. Laura and I had an opportunity a couple of weeks or so ago to uh, go camping in Virginia Mountains, beautiful area. And other than the lights on a few small handful of travel trailers that were camped around us, about five or six, there were not a whole lot of lights in the area. So sitting outside the few moments that we could endure the cold <laughs> and looking at the heavens and without the lights flooding them into a blur, you could see a clear sky and a larger array of stars. The same thing, the same stars perhaps then that Abraham looked at and considered there has to be a master creator. Yeah. Just to just to look at that and and just pick out a small spot and try to count the number of stars in the spot. I read the other day about our galaxy, our Milky Way system is small in comparison to the vast arrays of other systems that we are yet to discover or have discovered and they overwhelm us. And there are uncountable number of systems uh, and galaxies out there that he would put all of that in place and focus on sending his son here, of all the planetary bodies that are in existence. Many, many, if not most, if not all, in certain areas that we will never discover, but they're there. Why? For his pleasure? Yeah. Because yeah. he wanted them there? I got stuff in my closets that I don't use. Why is it there? Because I want it there. <laughs> and that's all the, that's all you need to know and that's all we need to know mike to go to to certain areas and look out at creation to study the innocence of a child and look at the sparkle in their eye and the purity of their heart 
to see their ways and the development of their of their personality, to think about the medical technique of the body, all the various systems and how they integrate and the design of the human being. To have a, a powerful encounter with somebody and have conversation that is life-changing and provoking, it just helps you to understand I need to bow myself down before this great wonder who he is. And I need to let him know I understand a little bit more about him. And in understanding more about him, I'm beginning to understand more about myself. You are high mm -hmm. and I am not. And I just want to celebrate the difference between us and contemplate that. That's worship. Yeah. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with you. I wonder if that is why there's, you know, we had during the 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 pandemic, pandemic, whatever people want to call it, uh, this move of people to leave the cities and and to go out of the suburbs. Why is it is it something within the the nature of people that's saying I want to get away from that? I want to get back out because. You know, the the heavens declare the glory of Yudhe Vavhe, his creation. Uh, I don't call it nature. His creation is what declares who he is. We see him at work when we see the the uh, the the creation around us. But when we lose track of that, I I've always I've often thought that the worst thing that ever happened regarding the study of the scripture is when we put it within four walls. When you bring it into a building, and and this could be true, I guess, of worship. When you bring it into a building, you put stained glass over the windows, you close the door, and you seal out creation. And you make this bubble that is man-made. And then wonder why you're having a hard time finding God. Now, I, I wish that I could say that I like to do worship settings outside or teaching settings outside. The problem is that, that people can't focus. <laughs> that, you know, a bird flies over a butterfly, you know, a squirrel, a squirrel, <laughs> and, and they've totally lost it. Where, in fact, if we were thinking right, the squirrel running across the platform should bring us to another level of worship. <laughs> you know, I mean, just, just saying there, you know, I, I know we've only, uh, I'm watching our time go out uh, pretty fast here, but uh, I, Daniel is, uh, has a pretty good, I think a pretty good idea of what's happening in the, the, uh, the music world, specifically Christian messianic, maybe, uh, but mainly a lot of Christian. And he listens to a guy, uh, Jeremy Riddle, uh, Daniel sprung this on us when we came back from Israel, that two days prior to us leaving for Israel, a song was introduced called Home. And I, he said, you know, he said he all of a sudden got this song, and here we are in Israel, and we're sending the pictures and the things. He says, I had to pull over numerous times off the road just to sit and weep because of the yearning for home. And as I listened to the words and uh, the first time I heard it, you know, I thought, wow, the average person would be thinking about heaven and the sweet by and by, and I'll fly away, oh glory. But as, as we were learning that song the first time, I've got flashbacks of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. flashbacks of, of the Galilee and the Golan. But what he said to me is that there is a, a movement going on within some of these circles for what is called raw worship. Yeah. And it's to the best of my understanding of what he's explained to me is it's about cutting out some of the tech and coming back to just maybe, maybe it's like the, the Jesus people, maybe it's like the coffee shops, but it's an intimacy an intimacy that gets lost in the production. Now, I'm I'm with you totally on this, that we need to do things well. 
he deserves us doing it well. Yes, he does. We we should do to the best of our ability. But does the production at some point become about us? And in every time it, anything becomes about me, it's less about him. You know, Yokanon standing on the side of the uh, the yard in the Jordan River, he looked as people were asking him about Yeshua, and he said, I must decrease that he may increase. And it's interesting, Barry, to me, the order of the words that Yokanon understood that his decision to decrease himself had to be done before Yeshua could increase within him. It's the tipping of the scales, Mike. We hold ourselves in parity with the Most High. We argue about, Yah says, I want you to do thus and such, speak such and such, and we begin to debate it. Therefore, we hold ourselves in parity with him. My will, your will, my will, your will. What, what you're describing is a total tipping of the scales. The mm-hmm. more I decrease, the more he increases. Um, it's a practice that is, in our minds, worthy and and correct. In our practice, we stumble at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, easier said than done is the phrase. So I would encourage anyone listening today, if you enjoy having, um, you know, certain music playing in, and, and worship with it, do that. If that's what you need to do in order to feel that you have engaged him, acknowledged him, praised him, focused on him and worshiped him, then by all means, utilize that and do it very well. But what I would also encourage, at least to experiment with, is sitting alone as quietly as you can and as quiet a place as you can. And, you know, it's not, you know, maybe we can talk about the word, reading the word as an act of worship next week. But it's not as though you got to go and read a psalm or something to get your mind going. Just stop and think. Now, every thought in the world is going to try to prevail upon your mind. And you yeah. need to, you know, uh, I had a rabbi a number of years ago. He said, have you learned to study yet? So what do you mean? He said, you've got to quieten yourself down and be mm-hmm. still enough that you can begin to focus. And then the challenge is to remain focused. Yeah. You have to train your mind to study. And that is a hard process to engage in, especially in our world. But if you can, maybe it's after everyone else in the house is is quiet. You may have to get up early in the morning. Whatever your process needs to be, contemplate. Set a goal for five minutes, ten minutes. I just want to think about him. Yeah, I want to imagine not so much what's going on in heaven. I want to rehearse what he's already done and the incredible ways he's already acted for me or for those that we know or the, in the stories that we read. These tour portions should be helping us to see the hand of Yah vitally at work in the lives of those that we're reading about. And just imagine what was it like for them to see this miraculous result that a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman, uh, a woman past menopause, is having a child. How does this happen? How does this work? Angelic visitations, the voice of the Creator sounding into their hearing. What was that like? And imagine, Father, could you possibly speak to me in the same way? Yeah. Those kinds of thoughts, just allowing your heart to focus and stay focused on him, contemplating on him. It rejuvenates your prayer life. 
It encourages your act of worship and is indeed worship itself. Yeah. So we about run out of time, Mike. Yeah, we have. And uh, let's, let's try to remember next week, unless something else comes up that uh, this, this idea of study is study worship or is there, is study for the sake of learning or study for something else? Try to remember. Write that. that down, Barry, so I'll remember it. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you so much for watching Foundations for Life, and we do encourage you to hit subscribes, uh, uh, like buttons on Mike's site, on mine if you like, and uh, we encourage you to share this in your social media pages if you would. Uh, we try to reach as many people as we can, and we're thankful that we reached you. Yeah. Mike, until next week, bro. You got it. See you then. All right.